So, welcome to the Upside Dimension of Elixir. This is an introduction to metaprogramming. Are you tired of having to write the same boiler code, uh, boilerplate code in multiple modules? Do you wish you could program in a language that more closely reflected the domain that you're working in? Is there a feature that you wished uh, that existed in the Elixir language? Well, open the gate uh, into the upside down dimension that is metaprogramming in Elixir. Metaprogramming is a tool that gives you superpowers like a mind slayer. Metaprogramming allows you to write code that writes code. So a great example of removing boilerplate code is when you generate a Phoenix application and by default you get this web module. This web module is used in your controllers to inject behavior into your views, into your router and into your channels. You can write domain-specific languages. Uh, so a great example here is HTML. So this feels like a little bit closer to crafting an HTML page. You can extend the language. Uh, you can add features. Are you missing a while loop? You can go ahead and make that feel like a first-class feature in Elixir. Don't write a while loop. <laughs> So the goals of this presentation tonight is to help sort of demystify metaprogramming in Elixir. We're going to build a mental model and understand the core concepts. And by the end of the night, you'll be able to read and write basic macros. So the prerequisite for tonight is to know some basic Elixir syntax. Uh, and certainly having a working knowledge of Elixir would be helpful. So does everyone sort of feel like they know the basic Elixir syntax? All right, good. <laughs> so just to give you a little bit of background in terms of my experience with metaprogramming, uh, I wrote a library called Typus, mostly for my personal use right now, um, to help me uh, define types in a very succinct way in Elixir. And this is kind of a nice example in that it, um, it sort of demonstrates those three things. So if you ever sort of created a struct and define the type spec you, um, in Elixir, uh, it gets a little bit verbose. So here, this library allows you to remove that uh, duplicate code. Um, it's closer to the domain in terms of defining types. It feels a little bit more natural. And, it, and the syntax itself feels like it's a first-class citizen in Elixir. But this talk is not about typist. This talk is about metaprogramming. So the approach tonight is that we're going to review a simple macro. And we're gonna, that's going to drive us in terms of learning the key concepts. I'm going to go ahead and then demo those concepts. And then we'll have multiple points of review and some time for questions, so then you don't have to worry about sort of saving your questions to the end. So we'll keep this uh, a, little, a little interactive. Uh, and then at that point, once we've covered those basic uh, concepts, then we'll go ahead and revisit that macro, and then reading that through, we should have a, a better of a understanding of how that works. So it's a very basic example that we're gonna be looking at. Um, so we have two modules. We have our calculator module that's going to add two numbers together. Uh, and then we have a tracer module that's going to trace the code that's being executed. And it's going to output a string showing the line of code that's being executed and the result. So let's take a look at that. Um, So, and actually, let's have a look at the calculator first. Okay. So this is a uh, this is the calculator module. Sort of very straightforward. We have our um, defining a calculator. Uh, sorry, defining the module. Um, we have a require function here, which we're going to come back to. And we're defining a function add, which takes in two operands, and then we're referencing the tracer module and calling trace. This looks like a function call, 
And then in our tracer module, again, we're defining a module, but this time we're not defining a function, we're defining a macro. And there's another couple of key words here that we want to take note of. We have quote and unquote that's used twice. Now, we're not going to look at this in detail, we're going to learn the concepts first and then we're going to come back and see how this actually works. So let's get, uh, so I'm going to start uh, IE, um, IEX, our REPL, and let's run extra, um, actually I want to run the calculator module. I'm going to add two numbers together. Okay, great. So that's all that macro is doing. And the kind of the cool thing about this is that this functionality of actually showing the lines that are being executed, you can only do this with a macro. So, um, so this is not like, oh, I could have just used a function for this. We really needed to, to use a macro to be able to actually display the, the lines of code being executed. Okay. So, um, so we have these three keys to open the gate of metaprogramming and we saw a def macro, quote and unquote. So it's these three pieces of syntax that we're going to be looking at when we're metaprogramming. So how do we write code that writes code? At a very basic level, we have our Elixir source code that goes through a compilation process which will um, compile our source code down to bytecode, this binary, represent binary representation. And that gets executed on the virtual machine at runtime. And um, to, to write code that writes code, we actually write macros and sort of the simplest way to think about it is that uh, the body of our macros get inlined in, the, in our modules and our functions. So I kind of like to think about these as two worlds. We have our human world where we write our business logic um, and this gets executed at runtime. We write it in our high level syntax, the, the, the Elixir syntax that we, uh, that we love. Uh, and we write functions. But in the upside down dimension, the dimension of metaprogramming, we're generating code. And that gets executed at compile time. And rather than this high level syntax that we deal with, we have this internal data structure. And instead of writing functions, we write macros. Now, this runtime versus compile time, high level syntax versus internal data structure, and functions versus macros is going to be the structure for, our, um, for the presentation for the rest of the night. So you can think of the, this presentation as three parts. So before moving into our first part, are there any questions? Okay, good. So let's have a look at a comparison of runtime versus compile time. So as I talked about, there's this uh, compilation process where we take our source code, go through a compiler and um, to bytecode, and this bytecode is executed by the Erlang VM. So we're gonna just do a very basic demo to actually show that we can ex uh, actually execute code at compile time instead of runtime. Then we're going to look at an example of how uh, runtime gets a little bit confused with compile time. Uh, and this is something that sort of shows up on the Elixir forum uh, once in a while. And certainly when I got into Elixir, I got, uh, I got sort of fooled or caught up by it as well. This is a relatively simple demo. We're going to start off gently. So we have a calculator module. And we can see when this calculator module is compiled is that we're going to get an output of this message at compile time. And of course, we're going to be used to our, our standard functions that we have, and of course, these get executed at runtime. So what I'm demonstrating here is showing that code can be uh, run, executed at compile time. So let's do that, um, actually. I need to compile, and I've lost the cursor again. Ah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so, hmm? It's on the other side of the 
Yes, it is. It is. That's what happens when you enter the upside down dimension. Things go crazy. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's see if I can do this. That's not what I wanted to happen. Okay, so uh, ignore the warning there. Uh, it's just because we're recompiling the module. Um, but you'll see in the green that we've outputted this message compile time. And all I've done here is I've just compiled the code. That's all. And of course, if we execute uh, that module, we'll see our runtime message being output there. So that's just to say, hey, we can execute code at compile time. So the next uh, demo I want to give is uh, this little bit of confusion that can occur when we're dealing with um, uh, uh, the comp compile time versus the runtime. So we have this time, we're, again, we're in our calculator module and we have two versions of this function. And uh, instead of just uh, outputting compile time or runtime, we can customize the message. So our first version uh, uses a, um, a module attribute and we're fetching something from the system environment. Uh, and this gets assigned to our uh, module attribute and that's outputted. We could have definitely put the module attribute uh, in line with the IO puts there. I just wanted to make sure that these two things looked exactly the same and the only difference is on line 10 and line 18. So let's, uh, let's do that. Okay, so we're foo. Uh, if we use our second version that's happening at runtime, it's foo. Um, now I'm gonna go back and change the message to bar. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yes, foo, okay. <laughs> Thanks Hugo. So the value foo is actually there at compile time. And so, so when we set that environment, uh, sorry, when we set that module attribute, that's been compiled. Um, and so that, will, that won't change. But uh, on line 18, we're actually pulling this out at runtime. And so when we ran the second version there, that's why we got bar. So the point of all of that was to, um, at runtime, of course, we're executing code, but at compile time, you can execute code. Uh, runtime has a sort of more of a dynamic nature to it, but compile time has a static nature to it, especially when we're uh, assigning things to module attributes. Uh, and the runtime we're executing bytecode, but at compile time we're generating bytecode. So any questions before, uh, before we move on? Okay, so our second part is to uh, look at this high level syntax compared to this internal data structure that we have at compile time. All right, so back to our com uh, compilation process. So remember we have some source code we have uh, that's being passed to the compiler and we're generating bytecode. And we're gonna use macros to change, uh, to generate code and in inline that. If we break out that compilation process a little bit more, uh, really what happens is, is that our source code gets parsed into an internal data structure and then that gets passed to the generator that's gonna generate the bytecode. Now, remember, this is just kind of a model and all models are wrong. There's more things that sort of go on here, but we're just, uh, we're just trying to keep it simple to build up that mental model in terms of how all of this works. So can we access this internal data structure uh, that's used to generate the bytecode? And yes, we can. And that's our first key is quote. So we're gonna demo um, uh, how quote works and, uh, and, and what, what, is it, what does it give us? Let's have a look. So in our first, um, uh, so remember in Tracer, in our Tracer module, we use, uh, we're using quote here. So now we're gonna get a little bit of a better feel for um, how it's actually used. So just so I don't, uh, so I'm gonna, Get my second demo here. Just gonna remind me exactly what to do. Okay, 
So the first thing that we're going to have a look at is, um, is what quote actually returns. Okay, interesting. Actually, let me just clear that and we can put that up at the top of the screen. Okay, so we get this three element tuple that's returned. And if we have a look at this, we can see this, uh, this plus sign that's mirroring here and we can see these uh, arguments these operands here, this one and two that we get from the, from the expression here. Now, uh, the way that we're using the plus sign here is actually an infix operator. An infix operator has its operands on either side. So if we were to turn that into a more of a traditional function call, it would look like that, something like this. Uh, we can't actually execute that. It's not actually valid, but the, the addition sign is actually on, um, is on kernel, is on the kernel module. So we can actually call it like that. It's actually a valid, uh, it's actually a valid call. So, um, so if we sort of take a look at this, coming back to this internal data structure, we can see the plus sign is basically our function call. And we have our, um, our arguments um, into that function call. So we can have a look at a, a bit of a more complicated example. Probably. So I've just added the, uh, the brackets there to be very explicit about the uh, order of execution. And so we have, a rel so we have this more complex uh, uh, structure here um, something I probably should have just sort of typed out here is that uh, this three element tuple um, has the, the function call. Uh, we actually have some metadata here and uh, we have a, a list of args just to, as a reminder there in terms of how that tuple is structured. So I'm going to switch back to the slides just so we can sort of see um, and review this internal data structure, this more complex example. So this is what uh, our up output was from the last thing that we quoted. So if we remove the data and we just, uh, sorry, if we remove the metadata and then we go ahead and remove the syntax, you can see this tree structure emerging. So let's do a diagram form of this tree structure. So here you can see in our uh, leaf nodes, we have the, op uh, the operands two and three, our args two and three, and our multipl uh, multiplication sign. Of course, this equals six. We're gonna add seven to it. Uh, sorry, we're gonna add one to it. That gives us seven. And then we minus three, and that gives us, um, sorry, we minus four, and that gives us three. And so we have this tree structure this in, um, for the internal data structure that's used to generate bytecode. And this is known as an abstract syntax tree. So from that sort of uh, structure that we're looking at, I first sort of said that we have this three element tuple with a function, metadata, and a list of args. But really what it is, is kind of like this function metadata with more uh, more of the tree stu tr uh, structure, more list of the ASTs. And this forms the syntactical structure of our source code. Um, if we go back and look at uh, the actual, whoops, oh no. If we go back and look at that structure there, um, although I'm using brackets, uh, parentheses, there's no parentheses in that internal data structure because it doesn't need it. Uh, and the structure is optimized for machines and it's used to generate our bytecode. Um, and this idea of an AST is sort of not new. There's actually languages like Lisp that, um, uh, um, that you actually code in the AST. So here we have this parameterized lists that create the tree structure. And Lisp is, is known for its extensibility. Uh, you can create DSLs in it. But, so it's very powerful, but you're kind of suffering in terms of the, the readability. Now, Elixir's approach is kind of interesting. You, when you're in the human world, you have this higher level syntax, 
Uh, and in the upside down dimension of metaprogramming, you have access to the AST. So you have the power to create, to extend the language and to create DSLs, but you also have the readability. So with quote, we can actually write this AST uh, in the higher level syntax. We could actually handcraft these tuples if we wanted to, um, but that's probably not going to be a lot of fun. Um, but we can use quote to actually create the AST for us. So when I sort of say that, hey, we can sort of handcraft these tuples, I can you know, simply do something where I'm creating this, uh, this structure. I've left out the, the metadata there. And I'm actually just going to, and I can actually evaluate this. But you probably don't want to be writing out code like this when you're metaprogramming. So quote really helps us out here. Now, the interesting thing is, now that we know this, we can talk about the fact that Elixir is written in Elixir, mostly. If we go to GitHub and look at the Elixir, um, look at the language stats on the GitHub repo, we'll actually see that Elixir's written in Elixir approximately 90%. So if we just have a quick look at the, uh, the humble if statement at the command line, I'm just going to bring up the, uh, the command line help in the IEX, and if we scroll up here, we can see that if is actually a macro. So, um, so to review, we know now that quote, our first key to metaprogramming, generates an AST. That's that internal data structure. It's a three element tuple. It has a function, some metadata, and a list of args or more AST. And if you look in the documentation, in the Alexa documentation, this is known as the macro T type. And we've also discovered that Alexa is written in Alexa using macros. Okay, so uh, before moving on, we'll just do a quick review. So we, um, we talk about having these two worlds, the human world, where we're writing business logic and that's being executed at runtime. We're writing in a high level syntax and we're defining functions. In the upside down dimension of metaprogramming, we're generating code uh, that's being executed at compile time. We have this internal data structure that we just looked at. Uh, and rather than writing functions, we're writing macros. And the keys to metaprogramming is def macro, quote, and unquote. So let's move on to the third part of functions versus macros. So our second key to metaprogramming is def macro. Uh, so we're probably very used to um, uh, writing functions in, um, in Elixir. Uh, and writing macros, the actual syntax for that is, is very similar, except it's def macro is the key word there. So let's do a quick comparison against these two things. So with def, we're defining functions and we're just receiving a term and, or multiple terms and outputting a term. Uh, with def macro, it's actually the same. We're still returning a term or taking in terms and returning a term, but uh, it's a special type of term. It's a special type. It's, uh, it's this AST, it's this macro T. Um, and of course, functions get invoked at uh, runtime. We did kind of see they can be invoked at compile time, depending on what we do with them. Um, but uh, with def macro, these are invoked at compile time. And with def, we only have to worry about the current context of the function that we're in. But with def macro, it gets a little bit more complicated. We have the macro context and we have the caller context. The, 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 the context that is actually calling that macro. But don't fear, we're going to have a look at uh, these with uh, some demos. So the first demo, we're going to uh, look at a macro receiving an AST and returning an AST. 
Uh, I'm going to look at macros being uh, invoked at compile time, and then we're going to have a look at this, uh, these differences in context. So, let's bring up another demo, and I've got the right one. Okay, cool. So, uh, what do we have here? Okay, so here we're going to demonstrate um, that a macro receives an AST. So, well, actually, let's do this and then we can actually see the error that we get. Okay, so here we, we're just simply calling the macro. This would be uh, called at compile time and we're passing in, simple thing here, one plus two, line of code. And we actually get an error. And that error is telling us that we must require this module. Why do we have to do that? It's because we've actually created a, a compile time dependency. Remember, macros are invoked at compile time. And so now we have a compile time dependency, although I'm just doing this in IEX, it's think of this at compile time. And so we need to make sure by doing require, we have made sure that that module has actually been compiled. Because if we're invoking something at compile time, we've got to make sure that that dependency is, um, has been compiled. So let's do the require. And now when I invoke that macro, we, sh we should be good to go. Now again, this would be, um, well, it's actually interesting. So <laughs> because we're in IEX, this does actually, um, uh, this does actually get compiled. Um, and then our one plus two gets uh, executed. And that's why we're getting the three here. But the most important part is, is that we can see the AST. So if we take a look at here, out of our trace macro, we're getting this param, which is the AST, and I've just, all I've done is just do an inspect on that. Okay, so our macros get an AST and it returns an AST. And our next one. Right, okay. So the next demo is to demonstrate that macros get invoked at compile time. So I am going to uh, recompile the, uh, this module that we're looking at here, the calculator module, and it's actually just going to invoke the, uh, the trace macro um, that we were just looking at, that we just executed. Uh, the R here is just a, a IAX helper where you can actually recompile um, a module. Uh, this module's been um, this module's been compiled before, so it knows that it exists. And I didn't quite copy and paste right. Okay, there we go. Good. So as you can see, I've just done a, a recompile of that module, and uh, and like before, we've just returned that AST. Um, so if we go back to this guy, oops. This message that's being outputted here is the uh, message from the macro. So here we can see we've just re recompiled our calculator module. Uh, we've called the trace macro and it's actually invoked that at compile time. And the structure should look pretty familiar by now. It's this internal data structure, it's the AST. Uh, the only kind of extra interesting thing is here is that we can kind of see how a var looks like um, in the AST. So if I just quickly do a, a quote, do x, um, you can see that it's represented by a atom there. So, uh, so now we know that a macro receives an AST, returns an AST. We know that macros are um, uh, invoked at compile time. And then the last demo. Oops. Uh, the last demo is uh, demonstrating this idea of different contexts. So again, we have our tracer module. 
we have our macro, our, tr our trace uh, function there. I'm not worried about the AST that's coming in for, the, uh, for this demo. Now, when we're in this space here for the, um, for the macro, we're going to be in the context of the macro. When we start using quote, we're going to be in the context of the caller. And in this case, when I'm talking about the caller, I'm talking about uh, when we're in the calculator function and we're calling the trace function, uh, the trace macro. Got to get those right. So again, here we're going to be in the macro context. This is happening at compile time. Uh, and then we're, um, once we're starting to use a quote, we're going to be in the caller context. Now, the easiest way to demonstrate that is by doing a compile on the calculator. And I really can't get that right. Okay, cool. Again, ignore the warnings, focus on the green. So we just did a recompile, the macro has been executed, and we see our output message macro context. And this is what's being executed here. Now, I've used the, um, the Dunder module. Uh, if you haven't heard of that term, Dunder. Uh, typically used in the Python community to... Exp double under. Exactly, double under, yep, to, uh, to express that. Um, it's actually kind of funny because it's only recently I've started looking at uh, Python and I was like, oh, yeah, that's a good name for it. <laughs> Um, I don't really hear Elixir use it at all. Um, so, so here we're actually using the, uh, the Dunder module here. And we can see that our macro is defined in that module and that it's been outputted here. So that demonstrates that that is the macro context. Now, once we're here, um, uh, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to invoke this uh, function. So hopefully I get my copy and paste right. Yes. Uh, it doesn't actually matter what I pass in here because I'm not actually going to be using that code at all. And so now that I've invoked this function, you can see here we're in the caller context and, uh, and we have the calculator module here. And it's this line here that's being executed at runtime. And we've demonstrated that although this was, uh, you know, we're refer referencing module here, it was actually in the calculator module that this code was executed. So one way to sort of think about it in very, curse, uh, in very sort of uh, coarse terms is that, whoops, Let's try that again, 13. Is that we've sort of essentially, whoops, inlined that statement uh, within the calculator function. And that's kind of what macros are about, right? We take a small line of code, this trace, and macros sort of grow, like ex um, ex expand these other lines that the, that the macro is, um, is encompassing. Okay, so we're kind of getting into the details here. So, okay, so we've been looking at the compilation process. We know that we have the source code. Um, it's going through a parser to develop this internal data structure that's used to generate the bytecode. But it gets a little bit more involved in that. And this is sort of the last sort of stage that we're looking at here. So yes, we do take the source code and we do pass it but we kind of get this initial stage of the AST. There's this other process that goes on known as expansion. And as they're at the expansion stage that we actually invoke the macros. So at some point, those macros have to be called. And then we get our expanded AST, and then that's what's sent to the generator that generates our bytecode that runs on the VM. Um, the nice thing is to make this a little bit more concrete, we can actually demonstrate this to, to make it a little more, uh, a little more real. 
Um, and this kind of shows how macros actually inject um, into the AST. So let's do that. I'll look at my script here. Yeah, okay, cool. So we'll copy and pasting. So, uh, so here we can kind of think about this as the, as the passing phase. So now we know that you can't pass uh, um, uh, invalid syntax. We'll, uh, we'll get an error there. Um, so this is the passing phase. And so now we have this AST. And if we look carefully at this AST, actually I'm just going to clear that and uh, just put that up at the top there. So if we look at this AST, we can actually see the reference to our macro. So there's our, macro, uh, there's our module that has the macro. Here's the macro, macro name uh, that we're calling. So we can actually see that in the AST. We can also see the, the one plus two. Here's the tuple here. That should feel pretty familiar by now. So we've passed, we've done our initial passing of the AST and then what happens is the next stage is the, is the uh, expansion. So I'm going to copy that in as well. And in the expansion phase, we, um, uh, we're going to invoke those macro, uh, that macro in there. Uh, and we can emulate this with the, the macro.expand uh, function, which takes a mac macro t, returns a macro t. And of course, I didn't require, so let's do that. We've got a compile time dependency there, so we've got to make sure that's available. Let's do that again. All right, so this is kind of the moneymaker. We now have, if we look at the last tuple here, we have the, and make sure everyone can see that, I'm not in everybody's way. Um, maybe I'll just clear that, put that at the top. Okay, so here you can see um, it, it is come, um, yeah, here you can see it's coming from the, the, the tracer module, um, but here we go, we've got the inspect from, um, I've got a little helper method on the upside down to do our inspects, but here you can see the function here. Um, and also you can see the caller to uh, context, uh, that's the label that we're using in there. So I'm just going to go back to our, um, yeah, so here we go. Here's this line that's being expanded in the AST. So let's just go and do that again, just to make sure. All right, taking our high level syntax uh, of Elixir and we've passed that and we have our initial AST we have our macro hasn't been invoked yet, and then we're going to do our expansion phase where those macros actually get invoked. And then we can see that the macro now is in line, well, the, the execution of the macro, the result of the macro is now in line in our AST. All right, so our final bit. Our final key is unquote. And unquote allows us to construct our AST dynamically. It's a little bit of an odd name because you'd say, think quote and unquote. Like unquote would be the reverse of that. It's, it's not, it's actually better, uh, maybe a better name would be like inline, something like that, inline fragment. Uh, but probably the easiest way is to think about it as string interpolation for code. And I'll demonstrate that. All right. So we have our quote there and we can see our X var in there. Now, what happens if I define X, if I actually give X a value? Not much. It's exactly the same. As an aside, this is known, known as uh, code hygiene. We like clean code. 
it's not exactly the same as that, but what it means is, is that you're not, you know, there, there's no, um, uh, within, within the context, you're, you're not polluting uh, the, uh, the AST, like the AST is hygienic in that it's not pulling anything out from its outside environment. But sometimes we need to dynamically create that AST based on parameters or data that we've passed in. And we can actually then, that's where unquote comes in. Oh, almost. There we go. Okay, so now, because we've used unquote, we've uh, actually inlined, we've taken, the, we've taken x now, and we've actually inlined the value that we defined before. Exactly, yes, yes, that's, a, that's another great way of looking at it, is that we've basically taken the context of the macro and, and put it in the caller's context, yep. Yep, right on. So kind of this sort of way of thinking about quote and unquote as sort of string interpolation for your code is if I do this. Now this is just, of course, our normal string. Let's do a clear up here. Just make sure that's up the top. So if we do that, I know one is assigned. Of course, it's just a string. But if I do this, Course, ah, oh, oh god, oh god. <laughs> Let's try that again. Uh, x equal one, x plus two. Nope, x plus two. Okay, uh, now add interpolation. Okay, so one's in there. And so we can kind of think of quote and unquote in those terms. Outside of quote. Oh, you can actually. <laughs> um, uh, let me finish this, and I'll and I'll uh, I'll demonstrate it. But that's actually a really good question, and and yes, you can. So uh, I'll I'll do that as a little extra once I've got through this. Okay. Um, right. So now we've looked at def and def macro. Uh, we you know we should be reasonably familiar with def, uh, it's how we define standard functions. Those are invoked at runtime mostly, uh, and we just have to worry about the current context of the function. Def macros, they're a little bit more complicated. They take an AST, we return an AST. They are invoked at compile time, and uh, we have this, you know, we've got to be aware of the macro context and the caller context. So, we're almost at the end. Um, and now we're just going to go back and we're going to look at this trace func uh, macro that we looked at at the start and we're just going to go through and annotate it and hopefully now from what we've learned tonight uh, it will be sort of a little clearer in terms of what's going on. So let's do that. Uh, let's look at the calculator. All right. So require we know that there's a compile time dependency and Elixir forces us to include require. If you ever used um, Ecto, uh, the query functions, and you've had to you know, come up with that error message where you have to do a require, uh, now you know. Um, is, there, is there another example in Elixir, that a common one where you have to do a require? Log yeah, logger, yeah, exactly. Because uh, logger, the, the, um, uh, those functions are implemented as macros. Um, and that, that's actually an optimization thing because um, if you're doing a debug statement uh, in your code and your log level in your environment is info, it's just going to, it's not going to compile that in there. So the other use case for uh, metaprogramming and macros is um, optimization. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry, I got a little sidetracked. Uh, okay, so we have a compile time dependency that, uh, and we have to do the, the, the require there. Um, and we have our runtime function here, and we know that, well, we know now that this is just not a, a standard function call, it's a macro, and that's going to be invoked at compile time. 
and we're, you know, we're passing in some code. Well, we're actually not really evaluating that code in there. We're actually passing that code into the macro because this, this X and X here is actually, a, it's going to be, sorry, the X plus Y is actually going to be a bit of AST that's passed into the macro. Everyone good with that? Nice. Uh, and then let's go to our macro code. Okay, so here's our macro. So we know what def macro does. And my keys aren't working. You're in search mode. Oh, I'm in search mode. Oh, I am in search mode, thank you. Um, okay, so we have a macro. Uh, and we know that this is, as we said, it's gonna be invoked at compile time. Not at runtime. Uh, we know that it's going to receive an AST, an output an AST. Um, here, this line here, um, uh, macro dot to string can actually take an AST and just convert it to a string for you. So if we do this, uh, do um, I'll just do this one, one plus two. And then I do a macro dot to string uh, v. Does everyone know v? It's a little helper in IEX to get the last uh, last output, last return value. So all that is doing is taking the um, the the AST and converting that to a string for you. Quite helpful in debugging, testing, that sort of thing when you're dealing with macros. Um, okay, cool. So, so here we're just converting that AST uh, into a string. And so here we're assigning that to source code as a string. And when we're saying the running source code as a string, so that's what's getting outputted there. Uh, we have to unquote it. As Hugo pointed out, we're, we've got something in the macro context that we need to inject into the callers context. So that's why we're using unquote there. So we do, we're using quote, so we don't have to handcraft this AST, this internal data structure by ourselves. Uh, we take the AST that we're getting past here um, and um, just inlining that into the, into the um, callers context and that's, we're just gonna be assigning that to the result. And then we just say, hey, we're just returning that result. Uh, and then, um, so that's the string that we're crafting there, and then we're just going to return that result at the, the end of the function. So uh, again, if we do xcalculator, that's what's, that's what's happening there. And that, my friends, is the upside down dimension of Elixir. There's some, uh, that, like here you just have the basics. So there's some more advanced concepts that I won't go into tonight. Um, but there's things like where you can accumulate module attributes um, and that's uh, used in X unit. There's some compile time hooks so you can expand all the AST and then right at the end before it starts generating the bytecode, you, you can do more things with the AST. Um, you can generate code from external data. So you can, you know, say you had some data in, fi uh, in, in, a, in a text file, you could actually generate uh, code from that, from APIs, from the database. The thing to kind of, uh, uh, to have in mind is that you're, you're, you have everything, all the programming functionality you have at compile time, uh, at runtime, is at compile time. You can use processes, agents, its, if, if you want to. So if you need to uh, gather state while you're uh, at compile time, you have, you have an agent, you can, you can use all of that. Um, and you can actually create, uh, especially with external files, you can create a uh, compile dependency on that external file. Uh, there's a, a module attribute for that. Um, and so if that external text file changes, then the recompilation happens. And there's actually cases in Elixir where they do that. Check the like, environment variables? Uh, except environment variables, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. That would have helped. So our final review, we have this human world where we uh, execute at runtime, we have our high level syntax and we're invoking functions.
in our upside down dimension of metaprogramming, we're focused on code generation. We're programming for the compile time environment. Our macros are getting invoked at compile time. We uh, have this internal data structure, this AST that we use, and rather than writing functions, we write macros. We can remove boilerplate code, we can write domain-specific languages, and we can add new language constructs that are first-class citizens in our um, Elixir code. Uh, there's some great books out there um, that you can have a, um, you can have a look at, uh, Metaprogramming Elixir, um, written by uh, Chris McCord. Um, it's nice, it's 100 pages, but it goes into some really good examples and goes into those advanced concepts that I just mentioned. If you already have the Programming Elixir um, book, um, there's a chapter on macros and code evaluation, which is a, a good intro. Um, there's a whole bunch of online resources. I won't sort of go through all of those, um, but um, uh, those are available as well. And these slides will be available online, so you can sort of check out the links uh, that are there. The one blog post there, though, is um, Understanding Elixir Macros by uh, Sasha uh, Zurich. is really, really, really good. It's a, it's a six-part series um, that's online. You can go and sort of have a look at that tomorrow, um, and that's excellent. And the trace example that I used tonight was uh, inspired by that. Um, this uh, repo is um, for the code that I have is online at this URL. Um, I'll post this out on the, um, on the message board tomorrow. Um, but have a player, if, if you still want to get familiar, have a play around with these examples. It's like playing around with this stuff will help sort of solidify it. Uh, admittedly, my understanding actually solidified a little bit more when I actually crafted this presentation, um, even after writing uh, Typist. Um, and you know, take a look at some of the source code in Elixir, because now you know that some of that stuff, is, well, most of that stuff is actually macros in itself. So check out if, see what's happening there. Look at GenServer to see what's happening there. Uh, and as I mentioned, that Understanding Elixir uh, Macros blog post is, is really, really good. And have fun in the upside down dimension. Mm -hmm.